Let's dig into Fulton County because you have not spoken extensively about uh, the case against Donald Trump and his co-defendants. So let me just start with what is your reaction to the indictment? I believe in our justice system. And as a former attorney, I respect very much the importance of allowing the judicial system to play itself out, to let the process unfold. I think that the district attorney has done an assiduous job of building the cases that she's built. We have seen four people plead guilty uh, early on, and we know that there are additional defendants, including the former president. The responsibility we have is to keep our eye on the ball, which is that this is about election conspiracy and attempting to undermine how our process works. No politician is entitled to win. I, I know that personally. Mm. But we are all entitled to trust the process. And when that process is threatened by outside actors who are willing to undermine election security and undermine and commit fraudulent acts to achieve their ends, then they are thwarting the will of the people. Yes, we have the right to question systems, absolutely. But what we do not have the right to do is manufacture information and manufacture crises in order to achieve political ends. So you have, of course, run for office in Georgia. You've hinted that you don't necessarily think that Republicans in Georgia will be moved by these indictments or this process, unless there's something significant that happens. I analyze, or I heard that, or in, it analyzed it as, as hearing that as a conviction. Do you think something like that could play out in the court system? between now and next November? Is that even possible? I think the, the speed of the trials will be entirely determined by the judge and the evidence presented and the defense is presented. And we don't know what the defense is going to do. I would say, though, that in politics, people have fairly hardened belief systems. And those who have seen the former president in action over the last now seven years, they know who he is. I'm not certain that the outcome of this case itself will shift their beliefs, because it's a question of whether you believe in him, or whether you like what he did when he was in office. Those are two very different mm. dynamics. And there are those who may revile his behavior but celebrate his outcomes. And that's the place where I think no one who shares my political values should get comfortable. We should not presume that the inputs necessarily connect to the outputs. Mm. And there are those who may not care for the persona of Donald Trump or even his actions, but who believe that he is the standard bearer for what they want to see. And that's the place where if I'm doing political analysis, we should focus. We need to focus on what good can we get done and not presume that a conviction is going to necessarily change the belief system of someone who really likes what he does. That, that is such an interesting point, because intellectually, many people who, who share our views might say, well, if he's convicted, then that will change people's minds. In your view, you're, it sounds like you're saying it may not. It probably won't. I grew up in a region of the country where politicians got indicted a lot and still kept their jobs or came back. So. There are certain minimum requirements in Georgia law under the RICO statute, as you referenced, including jail time. But we are talking about a former president here. There, there's a range of views on this. If he is convicted, do you think he should serve the minimum jail requirement? My belief is that there is a stature and a status associated with holding the highest office in the land, but that does not exonerate you or exempt you from having to face punishment. I would argue that depending on what he is convicted of, if he is convicted, there will certainly be a conversation about how to hold him accountable. And if jail time is appropriate, I believe that the court and the prosecution will negotiate what that looks like. And determine, and, but nobody's above the law. No one is above the law. However, we recognize that there are different needs for communities. There are people who are given not protections because they are better people, but protections because they face different outcomes. I think it is disingenuous to believe that a former president is going to be treated the same in terms of incarceration. We have to understand that there are threats that come along with having held that job that will have to be taken into account when determining punishment. So it's not clear. And they'll determine that through the legal process. It's, you're saying you would be comfortable with their determination. Absolutely. 
I want to ask you about threats, because this is something that has just been on the rise. I know you have been the subject of threats. Um, many, many people have. And a man was just in, indicted for threatening uh, Fonnie Willis, as well as, of course, the Fulton County Sheriff. Uh, Fonnie Willis revealed earlier this year that her office was receiving some pretty vile messages, which I am not going to quote, but extremely vile and offensive and threatening. How much do you think the former president's rhetoric has contributed to these type of threats that we're seeing against prosecutors and others in the legal system. It is absolutely connected. The, the former president has been blithe in his willingness to use invective to make his points. And he, I think, unfortunately ignores that people who hear him do not see it as rhetoric. They see it as instructional. And as someone who has seen my threat level increase when he sends out a, a tweet or makes a comment, I know that there is a connective tissue between his willingness to demean and undermine and to cast aspersions and the response of the public to say that this is an instruction manual for how we should respond and defend Donald Trump or defend some ethos that we think is true. You ran against Brian Kemp, and you've been outspoken about the impact that he and others have had on suppressing voters mm -hmm. and voter laws uh, across the state. His um, role in speaking out against what Donald Trump did leading up to 2020 and the role of some other Republicans has received a lot of attention. It was all over the indictment, maybe led in part to the indictment. Do you worry that that's going to give him and others a free pass for what they've done to suppress voters in the past, that people will forget about that? It already has. Uh, Brian Kemp did not commit a crime, uh, which is what Donald Trump called on him to do. And, and I applaud his refusal to commit a crime. I applaud his refusal to overturn an election that was rightfully conducted. But that does not create a hero. Doing your job is the expectation we, we should have. And one of the challenges of the last eight years has been a lowering of our threshold for what we expect of public officials. It is insufficient that you are lauded for simply doing the job you were hired to do and then you get to erase the bad you continue to do. The work done by Brian Kemp and Brad Raffsenberger to undermine access to the elections for average Georgians continues to reverberate. And it is a terrible, terrible, terrible stain on our democracy. You don't get to claim that you are a defender of democracy when you are still engaged in behavior that undermines it. I can very easily separate. Yes, thank you, Brian Kemp, for not suborning a terrible action, but that does not exempt you from the bad actions you've already committed.